From Tally to Cali, it's time to wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Warchant.com is your ultimate seminal sports source. And this is Wake Up Warchant, presented by Corner Pocket Bar and Grill. One more corner pocket. Now here's Warchant.com's ass on Hunch of Andy and Corey Clark. Wake up! What is up, everybody? It's Wake Up War Champ, presented by Corner Pocket Bar and Grill. Coming up on today's show, the Knolls active in the transfer portal, but did they pick up pieces that are plug and play? Once a Knoll, always a Knoll. Our thoughts on players exiting the portal and heading to new programs. And Michael Langston talks about the commitments that just dropped and the ones that could be forthcoming for the Knolls this week. Wake Up War Champ, presented by Corner Pocket Bar and Grill, Tallahassee, Florida. CPTallyBar.com, the website, 2475 Appalachian Parkway, Suite 201. And how sweet it is over at the Corner Pocket Bar and Grill when you show up from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. today. You'll have a lunch special for only $8.99 of a half pound all beef black Angus burger with a side dish of your choice. Straight fries, curly fries, onion rings, potato salad, coleslaw, broccoli, side salad, tater tots, or freshly cooked potato chips. Usually $12.99, but $8.99 from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. today at the Corner Pocket Bar and Grill because Bill and the CP loves you. Don't forget tomorrow, trivia night, 7 p.m., head over, have plenty of fun. That's what you do when you go to the Corner Pocket Bar and Grill. You have fun, you eat good food, cold drinks, maybe even see Corey Clark in the flesh, baby. Warchant.com, your ultimate semi sports source. Five-star rating and review, please. Thumbs up on the YouTube, you people that are still out there doing this. Uh, a couple of my friends were saying after the live show, like, why don't you guys do all your shows live, man? I just There's just something better about them. And I'm like, I don't know, man. I don't agree with it. But um, people do like the video element, but people still watch the show on YouTube when there is no video element. Corey, it's just a cartoon yeah. of us. You pouring champagne on yourself me blowing off an air horn and uh you're all there watching us i guess listening to us but we appreciate it do you appreciate it Corey? uh you know i do aslan i appreciate it more than anyone hmm. uh, yeah. absolutely i do appreciate it and i think as a as a youtube connoisseur myself i think what people do is they probably listen to us on youtube but they're not just sitting there staring at the screen they're probably working or uh. or doing other things i hope they're not just staring at that one picture right. uh, as they listen to us they're probably getting on with their day and maybe they're they uh, they got in the auxiliary cord in their car, mm, mm. listening to us on YouTube through their car. Do, would we rather them do YouTube or? I don't think there's really. The I podcast. just it's, it's crazy to me that I love. Yeah, I love it. We're gonna keep doing this thing on YouTube, everybody. But like, it was almost this weird functionality of this software that we were using to upload the podcast originally. It just automatically uploaded it to YouTube. And we get like 500, and then after a few months, like it went up to a thousand, and then after one season, it went up to like two thousand, and. It just kept growing. It was bizarre, um, but we love it. And uh, I, I'm going to start now when I see people out and they're like, oh, I love the show. I'm going to be like, I'm going to start doing like an informal straw poll. I'm like, do you listen to us on YouTube mm. or do you actually do the podcast? I wonder if anybody has like, has their mirror or has their uh, monitor got that image of our faces of the cartoon, like bled into the screen. Remember like when uh, plasma TVs or flat yeah. screens came yeah. out, it was like, yeah. don't keep the same image on your TV. It'll burn <laughs> through it. Right. Uh, but anyhow, I digress. Lots to talk about. Michael Langston will be joining us at the end of the program, which, by the way, speaking of YouTube, if you're listening to us on YouTube, you already listened to the video, probably. Uh, it was posted last night, So, uh, but it's for our podcast listeners that uh, are on the go and doing things conventionally. But uh, he's on the more optimistic bent of things, Corey. I don't know. where I think the fan base is pretty optimistic, too, on the whole, seemingly checking out the premium recruiting board throughout the weekend. Which well, shout out to somebody, by the way, who called me out for responding to a thread at like 9 p.m. on Saturday. They're like, oh, Aslan with the uh, Saturday single man special posting on the boards. <laughs> and I was like, hey, come on, man. You could have done it from your phone, right? Yeah, You were, yeah. you were at a bar. Uh, yeah. She went up to get a drink or go to the bathroom, and you yeah. took time to look at the th- uh, the message boards. Yeah, thanks, Corey. Appreciate it. Good save. Yep. Good save. Um, but, you know, seemingly, though, Corey, it's it's a weird thing because like, like, I guess I'll start off with the, the, the two commitments they got earlier on in the weekend. That's Earl Little Jr. from Alabama, a yeah. guy that was highly coveted for them in 2022. And then this past year, 23, Jalen Brown out of Gulliver uh, High School down there in Miami ends up going to LSU. I think he might have played in eight games but didn't record any stats offensively. Now, you get those two kids straight out of high school, and you're like, man, that of course. Blue, blue chip guys, yeah. great pedigree, um, great programs, highly sought after, awesome. I, I do wonder I, – I'm, I'm the guy that's taken it this way. I think most people are pretty excited about it, but I – some of the, the bloom is off the rose or whatever they call it, it feels like, when they, they go elsewhere and maybe they don't 
instantly become stars. Maybe a little unfair for Jalen Brown because he's just one year removed from high school. But you know, Earl Little Jr.'s been out of the the program down there in American Heritage for a few years and hasn't really found a footing in Alabama's very talented backfield. But how do you process you know these acquisitions in the portal? Is it is it a, a better thing almost to have a guy that, that that's so young and, and kind of raw still, or do you all obviously want that like Jared Verse, Braden Fisk, plug and play, set it and forget it? Well, look, I think I think these guys could both be plug and plays, uh, especially Little. I think I think uh, look, man, I was having actually the conversation with Brady because Brady's like, why didn't they go get the uh, who is the kid at LSU that was the freshman? Is it Brian Thomas? Really. Or, or maybe he's a sophomore. He's younger, though, right? Is it the, or is he draft eligible? He's somebody I hadn't really heard of. I'd heard of Malik Neighbors. But who was the other really good LSU receiver? I thought he was yeah, a little Yeah, Brian younger. Thomas. He's a little more lean, a little taller guy. Like no, but, fours, Bra- right? but Brady was like, why didn't they go get him in the portal? And I'm like, man, guys that produce like he produced at a place like LSU don't go in the portal. Those aren't, those aren't the portal. Uh, well, Quinshawn Judkins left Ole Miss, and he was like, you know. Has winning. he, though? I think Where is he? I think he's officially in. That doesn't mean he's left, though, right? right? Like fair, you know that, fair. and also, uh, I think running backs are different. In, in Ole Miss is an LSU. Fair. You know, LSU's fair. a step. Uh, LSU's a step above Ole Miss. My point being, like just because you you took you a, a year or two to get your footing as a cornerback at Alabama, when you're playing behind two first round picks, I don't I don't think that means the the die is cast on your career as a college football player. Just like it wasn't on Jermaine Johnson as a defensive end. He couldn't start at Georgia. He turned out okay. Got himself another sack, by the way, in the snow mm. on Sunday. Um, Suck it, Belichick. And, yep, that's right. And then Marvin's Jones. Marvin's – why do I keep doing that? <laughs> why do it doesn't make any that? sense. Marvin's <laughs> Jones. It doesn't make any sense. Marvin You're just. Jones. I guess you're anticipating the, 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 the S's coming up. The S coming yeah, there's up. another yeah. S coming, but yeah. that, that doesn't it, – it's preposterous. But Marvin Jones hasn't really accomplished a whole lot at Georgia, but that doesn't mean he can't. He's not ready to take off uh, now at Florida State. So that was my point with Brady. Was like, look, man, those guys like that aren't typically in the portal. To go get a dude that could maybe turn into a star or an all-conference type guy, you know, this is the problem that the Georgias and the Alabamas of the world are going to have. Is these guys are probably really good players. I think they're a little kid uh, might be really good. And they just didn't get a chance to show it at Alabama. And unlike eight years ago or five or six years ago, they don't stay around long enough to be developed. And then, okay, now you're our projected starter for 2024. They're out the door. Um, That's the problem they have when it comes to depth. That's why, again, Alabama wasn't typical Alabama this year. They were a two-loss, probably should have been a three-loss Alabama team. They're still great. They're still one of the best two or three programs in the country. But you're starting to see – you know, the talent's getting diluted a little bit. And I think that's what's happening. That's probably not the right word I use there with diluted. But the talent, you don't have the overall strength and numbers at a place like Alabama where if you lose a, a Kool-Aid McKinstry, you can bring in an Earl Little. Hmm. And he, you don't lose much. Like now if you lose your starting cornerback next year if you're Alabama, yes, you're going to bring in a guy that was highly uh, recruited and highly ranked, but with no experience. So this kid has been in a college campus now for two years at Alabama. So he's probably gotten some pretty good teaching. He's uh, he looks to be, you know, in the, you know, at least the stuff I saw on Twitter, the film I saw on Twitter from practice looks to be pretty darn good. And I don't know like what, like when just, you're not going to go get a, uh, what's the kid's name? Terry and Arnold. Right. Was he their other? They're not in the portal. So to get guys that are plug and play, he's going you pro either, probably Tallahassee. Well, right, yes, Arnold. yes. Yeah. It went, who went to? I didn't realize he went to JP too. Yeah, man. Holy moly, he must have terrorized <laughs> those did. kids in that conference. Yeah. yeah. Holy, I can't even imagine what he did. Uh, but anyway, um, so so to get guys from a place like Alabama or LSU, you're not going to get a starter. You're not going to get a proven commodity because they don't leave. But these guys. These guys do leave a lot, and you've already had some success with a guy like, you know, like we've talked about with Jermaine Johnson, and I'm sure there's some others I'm not thinking of right now. But that I think I think both of those guys have a chance to contribute immediately, and I don't know what else other than going and getting – like let's say you went and got an All-American or an All-Conference cornerback from – I'm just going to use it again – UTEP. <laughs> Kid that had played two years, All-Conference, had six picks last year, 
49 tackles, 12 passes defended. Is he better than the kid that's been at Alabama hmm. for two years? And that was a huge recruit coming out of high school. Don't know. But I don't think it's I don't think just because he wasn't starting at Alabama doesn't mean he can't be an all conference player at Florida State. Yeah, well said. I mean again, very young players, you know, got it a little mixed up there. Jalen Brown, I think, played in three games this past year, didn't record any stats. Earl Little right. Earl Little the junior goes by, but apparently Alabama has him as Earl Little the second. Uh, nine games he played in in twenty twenty two. Missed the first half of the season recovering from an injury, and then he played in three games uh, after that. So, uh, you know, basically redshirted for all intents and purposes there. But, yeah, obviously good pedigree with his father having played in the league and coming yeah. from a good program that, you know, obviously was coached by Patrick Sertan. So you, you do feel good about that. In high school, yeah. High school, sorry, yeah. yeah. Um, so th- those are good things that line up. But yeah, it's, it's one of those crazy things because if you would have gotten Jalen Brown 12 months ago, right. you're like, oh, man, we just got, you know, Justin Jefferson reincarnate. And then it's like, well, we went to Baton Rouge and he couldn't get on the field at all. So, but eh. most freshmen, I mean, look at that receiving core. Very, very good point. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? Like yeah. those guys were those guys were pretty darn good. It was hard to get on the field. Um, I I wouldn't judge Hakeem Williams because he couldn't yeah. get on the field much. You yeah. know what I mean? Or even Van Dravis Jacobs. Like I think that's the normal that's the normal role a freshman on an experienced veteran offense is going to have. It's hard to get on the field. You're not going to unseat Malik Neighbors. And they were in a lot of close games because their defense was so bad. So he didn't get a chance to even get his feet wet over there. But I don't think that – and, yeah, it's like um, – so that kid, the LSU kid, was in the class last year. Correct, Jalen uh, Brown. Then imagine Earl Little. Like, imagine the 2021 class, folks. As mad and as upset and everybody was with what Travis Hunter did it, for the class of – whatever that was, class of 22. If that same day you had gotten Earl Little Jr. and Marvin Jones Jr., did you see how I didn't do the Marvins there? Nailed it. I'm crushing it, gang. I'm crushing it. So if you'd have gotten Marvin Jones Jr. and Earl Little Jr. in that 2022 class, you would have been over the moon. Yeah. Well, Very you nice got palate. him now. Very nice palate cleanser, yeah. Right, but yeah. you got him now. With, with in the, You've got him now. They're two years older. They've been in two great college football programs for two years, yeah. and I think now they're really ready to contribute, you hope, and now let's look back at that 2022 class. Well, it looks a lot better, doesn't it? Yeah. You, yeah. You, you you recruited those guys well. They remembered you when they went in the portal. And the work you put in when they were in high school now leads them to your campus now. And for all we know, they might both be all-conference type players. So I think it's going to be interesting. I'm actually going to do a column on that when it's all done, when all the dust is settled. Like, where would these classes have ranked if – if we did, if they didn't, you know what I mean. If they yeah, would have yeah. just come to Florida State, like at the, the jump, and they're here yeah. now, which is all that matters. They're here now. Um, though, though, maybe the 2022 class is much better than we gave it credit for at the time. I think it is. Oh, and yeah. now the 2023 class. Not only did you did you have Hakeem Williams and Vandravius Jacobs as your wide receivers. Well, you lost Goldie Lawrence and you replaced them with a top hundred kid in the country, yeah. with this kid from LSU. So you know. I know they don't technically count as high school recruits, and they're not, they weren't part of your high school class, but as we move forward in the way college football works, that's the class of 22, and that's the class of 23, and you just added uh, some pretty nice pieces to both. Yeah, I feel like you're, you're almost kind of straddling the fence when you pick up these guys at this point in their careers, right? Because it's all about, like, listen, we saw what, what Georgia has, and that's because they're able to recruit really elite you know, quality and quantity when it comes to players straight out of high school. I mean, basically for all intents and purposes have just done that by adding these three guys when right. you throw in Marvin Jones Jr. into the mix. So, you know, hopefully you can stack, you know, this class uh, develops the way you hope it does 24. Hopefully a guy like KJ Sampson develops well and Daniel Lyons is next up. So if, if these guys can get going, you've, you've started creating this kind of this talent pipeline. And, you know, fair, unfairly, though, you know, the only thing I, I, I push back on this, though, is that, you know, we talk about these guys and being at these programs and they're they're behind more talented players that are probably going to the pros. Obviously, Malik Neighbors, Kool-Aid McKinstry, Terry on Arnold, et cetera. But, you know, if yeah, I just feel like if they wanted these guys to stick around, they would do everything they could. But I guess maybe that that's the whole NIL game right now that LSU could have wanted Jalen Brown to stick around and yeah. given him a lot. But maybe Florida State was able to provide a, a more robust picture of what his future could look like. So maybe I need to look at it through that lens. Maybe. And then also you got to think like, you know, the guys that are freaks, 
Um, they're the guys that play at Alabama and start and play a lot as freshmen and redshirt freshmen. They're the ones that start at LSU or contribute a lot at LSU. So maybe these guys, those are the first round picks. Those are the super duper stars that are ridiculous, like the Caleb Downs. Um, you know, they, they, those are the guys that play early at a place like Alabama at LSU. I think it's natural to, uh, you know, wait your turn and matriculate. My point being, again, they don't let those guys go. Alabama's always going to keep those guys, the special, special guys. But, you know, there's very no – Very good. You can still get – but you can get the very exactly good guys. Exactly right. right. And you can see, but still be an NFL player. Both these guys might play in the league. They both might be – I don't know. I am not even want to put a ceiling on what they are. I have no idea. But maybe they're both second or third day picks. Well, you still just went and got two NFL guys. You know, Alabama has dozens of them every year, but they're not – the difference now in college football is they don't get to hold them. They don't get to hoard them all. Hmm. You know, they're sprinkling out. You know, they, as soon as they lost, two days later, what, they have 11, 10 or 11 guys enter the portal immediately. Yeah. That's not the stuff that they're used – that's not what Alabama's ever had to do before. Um, they So, again, the special super-duper guys, clearly, uh, if they thought Earl Little was going to be the the next, uh, you know, Marlon Humphrey, that's oh, I'm just trying one. to throw good show one. off my Alabama, good job. Good job. My Alabama knowledge, um, that they, they, would, they would probably have tried to keep them – you know, tried harder to keep him, but you know that doesn't mean he can't be a very good college football player, and certainly doesn't mean that he's not a step up from what you would have had otherwise. Mm. And now, look, this kid, I think, I think he's probably going to be nickel. I would think, you know, as far as we know, Fentrell Cypress and Azaria Thomas are still here. You know, it's hard to know these days, folks. But I think school starts, you know, today. The 11th or something. I think yeah, add drop I, I thought it started the eighth. Yeah, yeah. But, I think uh, add drop ends the eleventh, maybe. Is yeah. The, okay. The so, or... um, so you got those two guys, and we both, and we, we, I think Azaria is very good. I think Cyprus is serviceable at worst, and pretty good. And then you throw this guy into maybe a, as a nickel. Maybe a safety. I don't know what they want to do with him, but um, I, you know, that that's three pretty good cornerbacks. And I know Jarian had a really good year, but maybe you're not taking the step down in the defensive backfield that you thought you were if this kid ends up being as good as we think he can be. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like that's you know Azaria, Fentrell, and now this kid. That's that's not bad to go along with the guys you brought in that you really liked. Uh, from last year's class and the freshmen from this year. I know they've got a, a bunch of DBs this year too. And then on Sunday, uh, they picked up two more as we sit here and record this for you. Grady Kelly, defensive lineman out of Colorado State, actual Florida native though. Or he mm-hmm. went to, he's from Navarre, went to Navarre, so who knows? Maybe he's, maybe he's from Ohio and his family moved down to Florida. So you always got to be tricky with these things. Got to be careful. Journalism, big J. And then right. Jalen Lucas, uh, who's from Louisiana, related to Ja'Kai Douglas, I guess it's, it's his older brother. Uh, it was at Indiana. I don't know how Lucas fits in uh, in terms of like swapping somebody out, swapping him, him in. But obviously, Grady Kelly's going to draw comparisons of Braden Fisk because you know both of their last names have five letters in it. Um, <laughs> sure. So you know <laughs> he's played a lot of football. He started the last. He started every single game this past year. Grady Kelly yeah. did. Played over five hundred snaps. Graded out at seventy four. Uh, his pass rush was at sixty six. All this according to Pro Football Focus. Seventeen pressures. Um, you know, maybe not nearly as heralded or uh, accomplished as Braden was at, at that level, but I think you know maybe people would argue that the Mountain West is a little bit more tough uh, yeah. than what was going on up in the what is this? wherever Western, Western Michigan, Michigan is uh, Mac Mac the Sorry, Bronco Mac. Conference are Mac. they in the Mac? Yeah, they're in the yeah, Mac. Yeah. Mac respect the Mac, everybody. Uh, so I guess let's start there with Grady Kelly. Just that's a a good pickup, man. Kid six two two eighty five. Again, joking about it with, with with you're losing with Fisk, but it just feels like you're probably going to be able to keep something comparable to that. Which I don't know if that's the right way to look at things in the portal, Corey, but that's the way I'm kind of looking at it right now. Yeah, I mean, I think he's a guy that's going to play and play a lot. You know, he was a he was a freshman All American at Colorado State. He was a redshirt freshman when he it wasn't his first year because he redshirted his first year. So he's been on co- in a college uh, weight room for three years. He was a freshman All American in 22. He was the Either the second or third highest def- highest rated defensive player on the team this past year. Um, you know, I'm not looking for. I know he's a white defensive tackle. I don't, and he's coming from a small school. I, I don't think he. I'm not going to predict that he's going to be the next Braden Fisk. Um, I don't think he's going to be as good as Braden Fisk because I think Braden Fisk was awesome. But again, I keep using this term a lot. Reasonable facsimile, yeah. close. If he can be close-ish to Braden Fisk, all right, man. Well, now you look at your defensive line again. Okay, it's not going to be as good as it was last year. 
But now you're looking at, you know, Daryl Jackson, Joshua Farmer, Grady Kelly, Patrick Payton, Marvin Jones Jr. That's five right there, and I don't know if they're done yet. But that's five right no, there. No, they're I, not. They're not. They're they're after guys here. Yeah. Yeah. So I but so I think those five. That's a nice way to start. It's a nice start, and and not even I shouldn't even say a nice start. That that is a that is a that is a good college defensive line in my opinion. It is not what you saw in Charlotte against Louisville. Clearly, you don't lose a Jared Burst and a Braden Fisk and a Fabian Lovett and just replenish. You aren't that school yet. But this is this gets you in the neighborhood, kind of in the neighborhood because I think this kid is pretty good. You know, I you know, he didn't he graded, you know, I and I may I wrote this in the story I wrote that's on the website now about him because he talked about Braden Fisk. He talked to him on the phone. And he graded higher this year at Colorado State than Braden Fisk did at Florida State. Hmm. Now, the competition's different, clearly. And I went back and looked at what Braden Fisk graded out at Western Michigan his last year, and it ain't close. Like he was incredible. Yeah. He was the number one rated player on that team. He graded out like 86%. He had 35 hurries. He was unblockable at that level. Mm-hmm. Grady Kelly is not unblockable. He was not unblockable at Colorado State. But he was a pretty darn good college football player. Productive. And he helps you. Yeah. He's better than, you know, look, I think Malcolm Ray just committed to Rutgers. Yeah, man. Uh, he's better than Malcolm Ray. He's better than Dennis Briggs. This is a guy that comes in and is an immediate upgrade on, over what you had on the roster, in my opinion. I could be wrong. Again, I, I feel free to admit that, and I will usually I will admit it when I'm wrong, but I think he's up in upgrade over what you had, and you needed some help on the defensive line. You needed some girth. I think he said he's 293 right now. Nice. Um, that's, man, you just need size, and you need quickness, and you need a leader. He's, he's engaged. You just – he mentioned that in his, in his interview afterwards. Um, so I, I just think that – that that is a nice piece. That is a nice piece. It's not Walter Nolan. It's not the piece that everybody wanted necessarily. He's not the number one rated guy in the portal. But these are the guys that make good defenses. Now, you you still need some stars, and you hope Marvin is that guy, and Patrick takes the next step, and those two are your stars on the defensive line. But, man, it's nice to have a – right now we're rotation of three defensive linemen, defensive tackles. That are pretty that we think can be pretty darn good, and uh, can rotate. And, and there's not much of a drop off between any of the three. Mm. But they're not Braden Fisk, any of them. But maybe if we give them a bunch of vitamin energy, mm. they'll be able to maximize their talents. That's what I try to do every single day when I take my half shot. Go to vitaminenergy.com. Use the promo code Warchamp Bogo. Warchamp B O G O. Buy one item, get one of equal or lesser value for absolutely free. You know that Vitamin Energy is the world's first and only clinically proven, clinically tested shot to be effective at reducing brain fog, improving your energy levels and your focus and your mood. Maybe you got some other things you want to try to improve. So you want to get the variety pack, I would suggest. That would give you pretty much everything they've got in the portfolio. It would get you the mood plus, the immune plus, workout plus, focus plus. It's all there for you, folks. Florida State alums hooking us up with that promo code. Again, Corey is... Or Champ Bogo. Boom. Shake it and take it, everybody. Check them out. VitaminEnergy.com. Jalen Lucas, Corey, running back uh, from Terrebonne, Louisiana, went up there to Indiana past few seasons. Penn State was hot on his trail. I think Mississippi State was another program that was very interested uh, in him. I think 2022, he might have been some sort of got some accolades for being a first team kind of special teams kick returner guy. Running back by trade, but he you know caught the ball for I think had maybe near near 300 yards receiving, a little mm-hmm. under 300 yards rushing, and had over 500 yards uh, returning the football. Uh, maybe one of those things that we really didn't you know you lost Trey, and I think when we think about losing Trey, you, you think about him toting the rock, and he's not going to I don't know if he's going to return punch Jalen Lucas, but you lose that facet when you also lose Keon Coleman. Maybe like a sneaky good pickup for the Knolls, getting a guy that seems to be uh, not just versatile but pretty adept at all those different aspects of having the ball in his hands. Yeah, man, he's electric when he has the ball in his hands. What's interesting about – I don't know what role he's going to play, though. You know, it's funny because before you started talking, I'd forgotten he was Ja'Kai's brother. Mm. And I'm like, man, this is just kind of like a – he looks like a faster Ja'Kai uh, when, I, when I was watching the highlights, especially on the kick return. Shifty, small, running back. He was a running back his first year at Indiana. He was mostly – I don't know if he was a running back this year, but most of his – he had a lot more catches this year, so I think he did both, like Ja'Kai. And then it's like it feels like – they're going to be competing for playing time. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> right. Norvell doesn't have a – he doesn't like two 5'8 guys on the field at, 
one time. He's going to have one, and maybe one's in the backfield. But look, it is another weapon. And, you know, you think about like that Pittsburgh game when they were just out of receivers. Well, that clearly doesn't seem like it's going to be a problem this year because I thought they already had a lot, and they just added two this weekend. If this kid is technically a receiver, now I guess he's a running back too. That's what they would list him as. But I think he's a running back. I guess maybe he's like a Toa Feely. I think Toa Feely's a more a more traditional running back than even this guy is. Yeah. But you wonder as you look at it, like this isn't. This seems like more of a. I just want. I want a playmaker, yeah. and I don't care where he is. I just want a playmaker on my team that we can get the ball to three or four times a game. They can do something special with it, maybe once every two games, like turn a a twelve yard out into a sixty yard touchdown, or have a game like Jakai did against Pitt, like. We have somebody on our roster, another Jakai clone. Clearly, this is his brother. Um, so that's interesting. It's because, you know, they do have, it looks to me anyway, they have a lot of bigger bodied guys, which is what you want. It's modern football. You want you love the 6'3 guys. Um, but, you know, how many times have we seen these teams get lit up, these defenses get lit up by the Jakai Douglases of the world? Mm-hmm are the uh, the Renfros of the world, like these little slot guys that right. just can't be covered in the middle of the field. I feel like you got a dude that can maybe do that, or even if you keep him at running back, he's a guy that's done it for a couple of years in the Big Ten. Um, I think he had a he had a long kickoff return against Michigan this year, and he's he's just a dude that is a playmaker when you get the ball in his hands. And he's, and he's, a, he's a bit more proven, obviously, than the guys you're bringing in this year, the four receivers you're bringing in this year. And he's more proven than pretty much – all the receivers you brought in last year, like Hakeem and Vandravius, I think those guys can be really good, but they haven't accomplished much. And if this guy's just a straight running back, well, I do think you needed some help there. I don't. I, I think you. What do you have? Toa Feely, Kaziah, yeah. and him, and Singleton. Mm, and we have, but other than Cam Davis, you're and then the two freshmen there. coming and in, right? Danzy, but, which everyone keeps telling me, do you never talk about Makai Danzy or Makai? Yeah. So you know, yeah, and you have Danzy and Davis coming in. You look, man. I I. I'm not giving up on Samuel Singleton at all. I don't see a lot of instinctive running with him in the little number, limited number of times I've seen him play. My point being, I don't know that he's really uh, a factor this year in 2024. I think he's still got a lot of room to grow and work. He's very, very fast. That's always nice to have. But I don't see him being a uh, even a second-string running back, even in the conversation of second-string running back in 2024. So, yeah, you needed some experience to help out with Toa Feely. In the freshman, because I, you know, I don't, I don't know what Kaziah is. It's nice to have a bigger bodied guy on the team for for short yardage and goal line, maybe. Um, but yeah, you you need more experience in that position, and they got it. Um, I just think, you know, when you look at the needs for this team and what we thought they needed going into twenty twenty four, I did think they needed a running back. I thought they would get maybe somebody, you know, somebody that had one hundred and seventy carries. Well, Somebody they're, they're after couple... Al, they're after Roydell Williams from Alabama. He could he could be that guy for him. I mean, they, okay. they lost out to Penny Boone to Louisville, but Roydell Williams is a, a real possibility. Yeah, but and then so you you just look. I I just I I would have thought. Well, we'll see how it all shakes out because they're not done, right? We don't think oh, they're no. done. No. So no. this just happened to be the timing of it. I don't I don't I don't want people to think that okay, well they only had. They only had seven spots available. Why did they just waste one on a kick returner slash running back whose brother, just like him, is already on the team? Well, they're not. They're, they, this wasn't like he took the spot of a linebacker. You know, they, they still know what they need. They still know the holes that they have uh, on the defensive line, probably on the offensive line, uh, linebacker. This doesn't preclude them from getting one of those guys. It's just another weapon. Um, for for Florida State to have, it's just the timing of it seemed like all right. We we you got you you already had ten wide receivers on the team, you know. I'm sure some of them might portal out after the spring when they see how things are shaking out. But right now you have like ten or eleven scholarship receivers, if you include the true freshmen that are going to be on the team. Uh, did you really need another one? But yeah, this LSU kid is probably worth that risk. And then this guy isn't technically a receiver, um, but he's going to be catching passes for you in this offense. And he is electric with the ball in his hands. You really can't have enough of those guys. Because in the reality is, right, Aslan, we know, like I just said, some of the dudes that are the skill players on this team right now will not be here in August. It's just the way of the world. They're going to leave. I'm not predicting who, but they are not going to keep every receiver that is currently on the roster or committed or signed or whatever will not be on this team in August. So 
you know, they're getting they're getting some playmakers to the offense. Yeah, and a little bit of a spoiler alert for the people on the podcast that haven't already listened to Michael's uh, video that was put put up on YouTube last night. But uh, according to Michael Corey, it seems like you know they do want another receiver and a big body receiver, and they're probably going to wait for that May window to open, um, which is. It's, you know, I don't know how that works to where you're just like, I mean, I know it worked out last year with Keon, but it just, it's always strikes me as like a, not, I'm not second guessing the coaching staff by any stretch here, but just the fact that you would think that like after spring, that's when that guy is going to kind of emerge out there, but you never know. Guys are always on different kind of timelines and everybody. So it might make more sense for somebody to, to stick it out through their spring and then enter the portal. So, uh, but yeah, they, they do need that, that six, four kind of guy. We're not going to get another six, seven guy which is right. a bummer, but we can live with someone who's 6'4", probably need that kind of diversity. Well, and they like the couple of the big body guys they brought in that are freshmen, but they're not going to be ready to play right. in Ireland. You know no. what I mean? That's not going to happen. Hakeem, big body kid, uh, didn't like the way he attacked the ball sometime in the Orange Bowl, like yeah. didn't go up and get it, didn't make plays on the ball, the ball skills that you'd like to see that Keon had. But remember, Keon had been playing college football for three years. Right. Hakeem had played four college football games. So that will get better. But they're clearly, you know, it's, it sure sounds like they know they're not good enough at wide receiver after losing, you know, Johnny and Keon and then Jaheim Bell. Their three, you know, leading pass catchers are all gone. They don't think they're good enough there. Yeah. And they're still going heavy after the edge, obviously, to try to replace what they're losing in, with Jared. But, you know, maybe, you know, again, Marvin Jones Jr. probably shouldn't be undersold in terms of what he could possibly do. But that that's probably the missing piece of this because I wonder – you know, I'm not trying to hold up a mirror to Florida State and say that I see Alabama, but that that seemed to be the the big knock on them this year. I, there was times where they had that the 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 Bond receiver and Jermaine Burton kind of had some you know explosive games for them out wide, but you know those guys wouldn't have got on the field ahead of you know that 2016 core or the or the 2014 right. core. Like having that special high level talent at wide receiver, that's what makes very good offenses elite, right? That's that's why we started seeing Florida State maybe, I don't want to say sputter, but then it looked the way they did in the first half of the season because Johnny was hurt. Right. Johnny was in and out of the lineup. Yep. Keon was in and out of the lineup dealing with injuries during practice. Like Having those guys is what makes your offense really just absolutely a nightmare to go up against. So they, don't, they don't have that right now, but hopefully they can find someone in the portal and then we're not going to discount that maybe Destin or, or Hakeem, one of those guys can make a really, or Van Dravis could just make a really crazy jump over the spring. Because yeah, I mean, I'm counting that. on it. I'm yeah. counting on at least okay. two of those guys doing it. Okay. I, I I do think that's a possibility for sure that that one or two or maybe all three of them make those big jumps, and uh, then maybe you see what you want to in March, and you're like, you know what, we don't need to go to the portal. We don't need to go to the portal for that spot. These three guys, along with who we brought in, along with Kentron, along I guess with Darian or whoever else, um, th this will be good enough to ride with in in 2024. I think you said last week this might be a story you'd write at some point. I don't know if you're joking or not, but you know Casey Roddick announced that he's going to go into the NFL draft. He's exhausted all of his eligibility. Uh, Dimitri yeah. Manuel is also gone, uh, but you keep everybody else that was in the starting lineup. Uh, Keandre Jones, I think, still is going to be sticking around. So yeah. uh, they try to go after the young man from Furman, who everyone told me he committed to South Carolina, but I never saw anything about him committing to South Carolina. But apparently, Florida State has moved on from uh, the, the young man Pearson Toomey. Mm. Um, Terrence Ferguson out of Alabama is a guy that visited. He also went to Oklahoma. Um, never going to turn down a guy that's ready to go right now. But the fact that they they have to go to the portal to find somebody is that a little bit worrisome, for lack of a better word, Corey. Uh, you just, you figured by the, the amount of guys that they've they've brought into this program now, one of these guys would emerge as somebody they could kind of go ahead and, and slot in place there. I don't know, maybe like, is Darius not that guy? Or, or they just want to be able to keep Darius flexible no matter what happens at the tackle spots? Well, I think they want depth either way. And, yeah, I love that they love having Darius play all the positions. Like, he's a great sixth guy to have. He's a really good college football player. First team all-conference. But he is a great – and I don't mean sixth that he's, like, the sixth right. best guy. Right. Just that if you have your starting lineup, you know you can put him in anywhere, even if he's not in the starting lineup. But you also know he's competing at three different spots to be a starter. Or two, really. He's not probably competing at center. But the other four, I guess, theoretically, he could be he could be competing at. Um, so, yeah, man, it, you know, you would like when it comes to when it comes to that position and honestly, the defensive line. 
you know, it would be cool to, like, know that you had a badass up-and-coming defensive tackle. Yeah. We're set. We got the next whoever. We've got the next Brain Fisk already here. We just recruited him. Or we've got the next so-and-so already here. Um, clearly, other than Peyton, it doesn't, it doesn't feel like they're 100% confident uh, with – who they have and the development, or if they would be ready to be big time contributors next year. Um, so that it's not concerning necessarily. It's just because this is the way of the world. You can go thirteen and zero building a roster like this, folks. We just saw it. Um, but you would like you would like if you're recruiting all these linemen. Well, how many linemen have they signed the last two years or three years? I'll go twelve. I'll look up the number. I mean, it sounds about right, but I'll look it up. And you're telling me out of these last three years. I'm talking about 22. Well, let's just go 22 and 23. Um, you don't think you hit on any of those? Like you're just going to keep running, and I don't, I don't run in as if they're bad. You're gonna, you're just, you're gonna have to bring in another transfer portal guy because none of the other 11 that you brought in are good enough to play alongside Maurice and Darius and Robert Scott. Like you would have thought, some of these guys would be ready, and I'm not saying they aren't. But, yeah, I mean, I guess if a kid from Alabama, if the Ferguson kid wants to come, you're not going to say no. But it would be nice to know, like, start playing your own guys again. Start plugging holes with dudes that you've developed. That's probably – that. that is the next step in this program. Because those dudes that you're developing, the guys you signed, are awesome. And they couldn't play as freshmen because freshmen don't play offensive line. Uh, but – as redshirt freshmen or redshirt sophomores, they're ready to go and they're ready to be really good. And it just doesn't seem like they believe in the guys they've recruited the last couple of years. Maybe. That's the impression I get anyway. Yeah, tough to count the numbers because they don't sort it by anything. I, I counted seven from the 2022 class, but it also included some of the transfer players there. But yeah, like the Antavius Woodies, the Quayshon Saps. Uh, those obviously haven't worked out. You were hoping like maybe a, a Kaniah Charlton or at this point a uh, – um, what's our guy from uh, Georgia went to the same school as Brady Scott? You feel like a Bryson Essies might be ready to go ahead yeah. and fill that that guard spot there. Just hasn't worked out that way. But you do or like Mella, yeah. You know, guys like that. And so, um, yeah. I mean, look, you've got it. It's not your job to just say, "Hey, man, we recruited you two years ago. We really like you. You get to play now." You've got to earn a spot. And if there's a guy out there that's better than what you've got on your roster currently. Um, then, yeah, you need to go get them. It's just I don't know that you're, you're never going to have a great offensive line like this. The great offensive lines are the ones that you recruit, evaluate, and develop on your own. And maybe you plug in one guy. Um, and, look, I, 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 I'm saying that now. That's probably what they're going to do. But they just came off a year where they brought in three guys. Right? Is it three or four? Keandre, Jeremiah, um, and Casey Roddick. Yes. And so they brought in three guys, and then they got Dimitri an extra year they didn't even know they were going to have. So they they basically got four guys with a ton of experience added to that team. And then here you are again. You're, you're losing a few of those guys, and you're, you're having to go back out to the portal again. Um, same thing with the defensive line. Uh, but I think what that – to me what that means is that, like, there, I think, again, I taught, we talked about this near signing day and back in December. The pod is bigger now. It is different. They, I think they're in on bigger and better kids – than they were two or three years ago, um, so I think that is the next that is the next phase of this program building, is guys like that, that you because you hope offensive and defensive linemen realize that if they don't play early, that does not mean they're not in the plans because nobody plays early, um, but you so you would hope that the next step is you get a red you start seeing red shirt freshmen sprinkled in on these offensive and defensive lines and maybe not starting, but playing and contributing. And then by the time they're their third year in the system, they're starting and they're awesome. Like that's the next step because you've developed other positions, but this one, it just, it, yeah, they're, they're, it feels like they don't, the, the la the guys that they've had on their, their roster for the last two, two years, they only trust four of them. Right. They trust Maurice, Robert. they trust Darius, they trust Robert Scott. And Robert's the only guy they really recruited, like, out of high school. You know, this this staff, they obviously brought Maurice, um, you know, it was the previous staff. So, um, yeah, just 
again, I complain. I'm not, you know, as I'm looking for things to complain for, just kind of found it interesting. And again, it's not a big problem. I'm only going after one guard apparently here in the, right. in, the off, in the in the transfer portal. So, but you just wonder what happens when Maurice and you know Jeremiah and, and Darius, because this is this is their last go around. Just who's yeah. going to step in at that point? But you know. Everything just comes back to you. Well, shoot, why can't we just go in the portal and go ahead and plug and play? And you, you yeah, but that's can. why you want to see him start like the Lucas Simmonses of the world. Yeah. Uh, now he he didn't get a chance to practice a ton, but uh, you you want to see those guys develop. Are the Armellas or the Earlies, people yeah. like that that you think have a chance? Um, you know, you'd like to know where you where you stand with these guys after a year or two. Are these guys? Can they start? Are they potential starters? Are they potential first-round picks? Like, where are you with these guys? How good are they going to be? Just start building from within, especially at that position. I think just at that position, it is critical to build from within because it's really hard every year to go mix and match and still be good on the offensive line. Like you saw this year, man. They weren't very good on the offensive line. They were not. They brought in three dudes. They were okay. They were not special. Um the special offensive lines typically are the ones you build up your own. Thoughts on Tate Rodemaker committing to Southern Miss, Corey Clark? Feels like a pretty good fit for him, doesn't it? Yeah. 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 He seems like a Hattiesburg kid. Yeah, he'll tear it up in the Berg. Yeah. I just wonder how it worked with, because Will Hall used to coach under Norvell, so I wonder how, like, was a was a did Norvell, like, facilitate it? Did Will Hall... Like try to get the blessing on. I mean, we'll never we'll never know the answer to this. But that was the only thing that kind of stood out to me to be a little bit of an interesting thing because, you know, you'd figure when you're getting guys from maybe your old bosses roster, there'd be some sort of communication. Maybe there was. And you know, listen, I have no. It, I was so proud of FSU uh, people on social media on Saturday because Malcolm Ray announced that he was going to Rutgers and Tate tweeted out that he was going out to Southern Miss and. I literally didn't see one negative comment in like the 20 to Tate's tweet. And then I think of the 20 that I maybe saw from Malcolm Ray, there was one person that was like, well, that's a really weird decision, but good luck, which isn't that bad considering what's out there on social media. So shout out to everybody on, on, on Florida state social media for being really well behaved. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, that, that warmed the cackles of my heart. Cord to see that everybody's like, all right, like wishing Malcolm Ray well and wishing Tate Rodemaker well. Although I think I saw somebody on the board say that they hope they get some shots in on him if they ever play Southern Miss, and it's like, whoa, whoa. I don't, I don't well, know. I mean, I feel like they do think that he left them in the lurch, but I mean, you can also, especially with hindsight, guys. Forty nine to seventeen sounds better than sixty three to three, I guess. Right? right, but I think Tate saw film and saw what he was working with, and was like, this isn't going to be fun for anybody. Um, I mean, look, what would have mattered if he was there? Maybe, a, maybe a score or two, um, but without his weapons, you know. He lives to he lives to fight on in Hattiesburg. Um, that said, I you know he played Southern Miss this year. That's true. So he went three for three for seventy three yards and two touchdowns. Yeah, I like a five hundred seventy three quarterback rating. So yeah, man. So they saw hey they saw what they needed to. Southern Miss was like wow who's this kid slinging it around? Commander's Let's keep big. our eyes on him because the kid that started for Southern Miss, the great Billy Wiles, was eleven for thirty four. So uh, Tate probably looked really good compared to them. And look, I hope nobody has any ill will towards Malcolm Ray. He played. Yeah. He yeah. played in the Orange Bowl. He stayed and played, knowing he was probably going to leave. Um, good for him landing on his feet. Uh, I think there's still a couple out there that are in the portal from Florida State that do not have homes. Has Tafasi found a home? Yeah, Georgia Tech, I want to say. He went to Georgia Tech? Yeah. yeah oh, so they're going to play him next year? Let me put it on. Let me pull it up here because – I go into Ira's thread because um, Ira just posts to everyone like, hey, they're leaving, and I go in there and I let people know where they landed. Yeah, Tafasi committed to Tech on the 30th. Oh, man, I didn't know that. See, here's the problem. <laughs> there is a chance that Tafasi has four and a half tackles for loss in that game. <laughs> no. In Ireland. Hey, you DeAndre don't know, man. Andre and Maurice Smith and Let's whoever. hope. Let's hope. But that kid, and he's going to, you know, there's gonna, he's certainly going to be motivated. Um, but, yeah, so, like, you know, Malcolm Ray play, stayed in that game, and I, you know, I, I don't think that's – I love the kid. I had a great nickname for him and everything. <laughs> but that's not, a, that's not a big loss, losing him to Rutgers. Um, at most, he's depth at Florida State. He's not special. He's never proven to be special. Uh, I love that he stayed, even though he's in the portal. I think that makes him kind of a special teammate yeah. and a special person. But as far as on the football field, he was never going to be more, in my opinion, than what he was. And you kind of needed to either recruit over him or portal over him. 
and they portaled over him, and I don't think they're done. But I, it's awesome that he landed on his feet, man. You want him to go succeed at other places. You want Tafasi, I guess, to succeed. Well, I don't know. He didn't yeah, really give you anything. No, no. Um, Malcolm Ray did. Malcolm yeah. Ray was here for a good long time, was part of some great, uh, uh, you know, a great team and a good team um, in 2022. And you want him to go have some success at the next level and get to play. And he should probably get to play more at Rutgers than he would have at Florida State with Farmer and Jackson and now Kelly in the mix. Also, if you folks are wondering about what's going on with the football-only facility, uh, which they were set to get started on, I think, like right after the Florida game, pretty much, or not right after the Florida game, but right after the season ended, uh, they had the situation with getting a new general contractor, I guess, or construction company for it. They do have a new construction company in place. Uh, this is according to our own Gene Williams. It was reported over the weekend, Friday, so we can put on the we can put on the show now, give it away for free after it was behind our paywall over at WarChant.com. But who wants to wait in this day and age? You want things first? Go to WarChant.com, subscribe. So we'll also start in the, in the coming days here, Corey. So okay, RIP good, us great. having decent parking, I think, to be able to walk. I wonder, where are we going to start parking now? We're going to have to like, carpool together. You might have to come swing by and pick me up, man. Just Uber. I'll just Uber <laughs> and make Gene, make Gene pay for it. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, so, uh, the football and facility still thing is happening. Um, and then shout out to our guy, Walt Bell landing on his feet. OC at Western Michigan. Mm. Can't keep a good guy down. Right. And Leonard Hamilton and the boys, two wins in a row over ACC foes. Yeah. Despite the, the, the great efforts of the referees to give that game away, perhaps, uh, holding on to beat Georgia tech feels good because things didn't feel good. A week ago, so how quickly things change in this game of basketball. Ryan Russell well, was saying this on his podcast where it'd be interesting if the NBA was – obviously you can't have just only one game a week because they play 80 games or whatever it is. But with, with the NFL, everything is just so reactionary. It's like that yes. snapshot, that one game, and that's all you have. It'd be so much more interesting if there was just like that one game a week where the Florida State played and that's all we had. But, you know, they play like three games in a nine-day stretch or whatever it is or ten-day stretch and – you know, the first one looked gross, uh, and then the last two have looked pretty good. So we'll take it. Yeah, you know, I, I thought they did. I know people maybe right now are dialed into basketball that much, but, you know, I thought the Georgia Tech game was probably the best they played all season, uh, at least here lately. I mean, I know they rolled through some teams early, and the Colorado win was nice. And then they I'm built sorry, it's Virginia it. Tech they beat on Saturday. I'll yeah, they, well, Tech. that's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, they beat Georgia Tech earlier in the week, uh, which was a nice win, especially after losing at home to Lipscomb and being down 21 in the second half in front of 900 people. Like, that felt like a low point in the tenure. And then to come back after that, still not a lot of people there, but um, come back to beat Georgia Tech, who's not a horrible team. This is not a horrible Georgia Tech team. They're decent. So is Virginia Tech. And Virginia Tech shot well, and you still beat them. Uh, and I thought you played. I thought they played really hard defensively. They got unlucky a few times, and then once they got the, I think they had a ten point lead with like two minutes to go or two twenty to go, and then just Virginia Tech just started scoring at will. Florida State clearly is not very good at guarding in those moments. They don't want to foul, so they back off a little bit. And then they give kids either open jumpers or free run to the basket. And then they foul them at the basket or they let them hit a layup. That's how they lost to Georgia after blowing a big lead. That's how they blew the big lead on, on Saturday against Virginia Tech. But they got the win because they came back after letting Virginia Tech score, I guess, eight straight points to tie it up. And Primo Spears missed two free throws, which would have iced the game. Like they, He's an 88% free throw shooter. He gets a rebound with 13 seconds left, holds the ball to get fouled because that's what you want. That's what he's supposed to do. He's the free throw shooter. And with a two-point lead, he misses both. And then Virginia Tech gets fouled and uh, and ties the game with two free throws. Primo then gets fouled driving to the basket. And I think it was a foul. I don't know how many of you watched it. But in they sh kept showing the replay, and it looked like the kid got all ball, which I think he did. But he's leg-checking him out of bounds with his hip and his leg as he's – trying to lay up the ball. And he flew out of bounds because he got leg checked. So I did think it was a good call. And he makes he comes back and makes both three throws to essentially win the game. So uh, that was it's good to see because it looked, man, we've seen what this thing looks like when it falls off a cliff. We've seen what it looks like when the team just stops competing. And there when you when you've lost when you're down twenty one to Lipscomb at home, that's a time where you just like what it this is done. We're done. This season's over. This team's horrible. They're going to give up on each other, but they didn't. They came back and they lost that game by three, but they came back and made it a game, and then they've won their next two since then, over two ACC teams. And I think Virginia Tech could maybe be a bubble team. Um, so, yeah, man, not, not bad. It's still a lot of work to do. I mean, 
Florida State reached some pretty high highs uh, three and four years ago, so this is not acceptable where they are. But it's a nice start to at least be respectable. And it looks like this year they have a chance to be respectable because last year they were not. Fifth best winning streak in the conference. If the season ended right now, they'd be the sixth seed in the conference tournament. Let's go, Knowles. Let's go. And I think they got another home game on Tuesday. All right. Maybe I'll uh, get Wake. One. Ooh, which is Wake's, uh, Wake's, Wake's one on top in the of the conference. conference. Yeah. yeah, so that'd be, a, that'd be Hey, show up, guys. <laughs> I can promise you there's good tickets available <laughs> from the web from the website, from the ticket office, or even one of your secondary brokers. You can get some good seats. So go go watch Florida State play Wake. I did want to say this real quick, Aslan. I, I, great win, good win. I thought they played hard. I thought Baba had by far his best game. Jalen Ganey was, also had some tough buckets towards the end of the did, game. He did, man. He did. To, yeah, that was good yeah. to see. But Baba just – reached a new level of, like, physicality mm. and uh, just seemed like a different dude. He fouled out, but he, I thought, you know, I think he had eight points, but he had, like, 11 rebounds, a few blocks. Florida State missed four straight free throws at one point, maybe five, and they got the rebound on every one. And then when, three times it led to and ones. Then they'd miss the free throw, then get the rebound again and get fouled, make another basket. It was a crazy stretch where they kind of took over the game. That was good to see. I thought they played physical. I thought they played hard defensively. But, man – I'm just saying this. I, I'm not as bad in basketball as I am at football when it comes to time, management, score, clock, all that, where I criticize everyone. But Primo Spears is shooting a free throw with, I think, I don't know what, 1.2 seconds left? 1.4 seconds left. Oh, yeah. He's shooting two free throws. It's a tie game. Oh. Virginia Tech doesn't have any timeouts. Correct. He makes the first one. Mm -hmm. So you have the lead. There is no reason in God's on God's green earth under any circumstance to make do it. you make yeah. the second free throw. Yeah. Because what what happens, Aslan, if he misses the free throw? If the ball bounces off the rim? Uh, what kind of shot is Virginia Tech going to get with 1.2 seconds left? An astronomically low percentage one. From 90 feet. Yeah. They would have to make a 90-footer. And if they make a 90-footer, well, whether you made that free throw or not, you were still going to lose the game. The three-pointer still beats you. And if you lose by a 90-footer, you lost by a 90-footer. Also, he'd have somebody up there. I mean, it'd be the most incredible shot in ACC history. Miss it intentionally there. Make them have to make a 90-footer to beat you. So what happens is he makes it for some reason. Virginia Tech then tries a baseball pass, which the kid was kind of open where he, he would have had he would have had to make like an 18 foot turnaround jumper but no. that have, that's happened before within a second that better odds happen. than the 90 footer correct but he doesn't touch it at all <laughs> so it goes out of bounds so Florida State now has the ball underneath the Virginia Tech basket because it goes back to where the pass came from so all Virginia all Florida State has to do is catch the ball and the game is essentially over well they foul bowl bowl Bowen right yeah. before um before he can or right as he's catching it. So he's shooting a free throw with 1.2 seconds left. Again, Virginia Tech doesn't have any timeouts. He makes the first one. That makes it a three-point game. If you're shooting a free throw, Aslan, with 1.2 seconds left, and you have a three-point lead, wouldn't you just try to make it? Yeah. To then make it a four-point game? Yeah, then it's over, yeah. He intentionally misses it. <laughs> He throws it off the backboard very hard. He's got a nice touch, so this is not one of those where, I don't know, he's he's such a bad free throw. No, he's a pretty good free throw shooter. He's got a nice touch. He bricks it off the backboard intentionally hard. It bounces. It starts bouncing towards half court a little bit because all the Florida State's players are by half court. And the kid actually has a free run at like an 82-footer to tie the game, but the clock, the clock Man, started before it should have, <laughs> and the game was over anyway, and nobody complained. But, I mean, he wasn't going to make it. It was an 84-footer, but it's like – he the kid made it when he should have intentionally missed it. Yeah. And then the kid, when he should have made it the next time down, Didn't intentionally misses it. Yeah. yeah, it was not great. <laughs> but, you know, it's look, we're not, picking, we're not picking at Nats, uh, Nits, man. Yeah. They're, they're two-game two, two game winning streak for the Knowles, and that's really good to see because I was really worried we were about to repeat last year after the Lipscomb game. But clearly not. Clearly they have some fight in them, um, and they, they're at least going to probably have a respectable season. Number one. That's enough about basketball. Sorry, gang. Love you guys. Number one, Michigan taking on number two, Washington tonight, 830. Corey Clark, will the game be more competitive than last year's national championship game? Yes. I'm going to go on record and say that. Yes. I'm, I'm actually excited kind of about it. I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a good matchup, um, a really good matchup. 
It should be, could be Florida State in Houston, but it isn't. And Tate Rodemaker is now in Hattiesburg. I don't know who to root for, man. This is really a tough one. Washington. Yeah. Yeah, man, you can't root for Harbaugh. He's what? leaving either way. He's America's coach. It's America's team, man. It's he's not a, he's clearly not America's team because their whole motto is Michigan versus everybody. Well, that's true. So yeah. it's it's not like we're all we are the world. Very native. He knows everybody hates him. Yeah. Yeah, I guess. Um, I it feels like Michigan has a better shot at probably ending up back in this spot at some point. Although, like that, that would be to totally discount what Kellen DeBoer has done. Uh, and his ability to develop a core. And they got the Will Rogers kid from Mississippi State ready to take over once Penix leaves. But um, yeah, I'll be I'll be happy with whoever wins, but I'll also be sad uh, too because I'd love to see Harbaugh win because I do like Harbaugh just because he pisses off most people and I, I don't know exactly yeah. most people can't really articulate why. So I'm just like, why don't you like him? Like, I just don't like him. Well, why don't you like him? Uh, I do like though. I do like that it's two non-SEC teams. Yeah, um, I do fantastic. like that. Now it's a it's two Big Ten teams, and we're going to see this a lot in the next decade too. It's going to be those two conferences mainly. But um, and I do think we're going to see more. I liked it if Washington wins; it's their first championship in 32 years. And if Michigan wins, it's their first championship in 26. So yeah. it's cool to have some sort of new blood. I know Michigan's a blue blood, quote unquote, but they have a, they've won one national title since I've been alive. Yep. Um, so Same. it's not like they do this a lot. Uh, so I think it is cool to see some new teams in there. And that's, I just think, Washington, because they, man, Michigan's had some nice seasons over the last 25 years. Uh, they've had some really good players and some good teams. Washington, for all intents and purposes, kind of disappeared for three decades. And now here they are back um, with, a, with a real chance to win a national title, and I think that'd be cool. Well, they, you know, well, you know, they were good with Chris Peterson. They had a good run there with Chris Peterson. They made the yeah, playoffs. but they weren't really. I know we never thought they were going to win a national title with that guy. Right. Like even when they made the playoff, you're like, okay, good luck. You got. I don't even remember who they, they had lost Alabama. To. They had Alabama. Yeah, yeah had good Alabama. luck. So, yeah. and then Michigan State, I think, had Alabama the year before. Yeah, so. yeah weird how Alabama always got that. <laughs> it's weird. Weird how Alabama always gets those matchups. Uh, cue up the music. MyBookie.ag. Promo code is WarChant. Use that when you sign up for the first time for an instant cash deposit bonus. Uh, again, tonight's game, 8.30, Michigan taking on Washington. Four and a half points. The Wolverines are favored by Corey. The total points, 56 and a half. Um, my buddy Bill out there, uh, is, he's going to have me put a bet in for him. He wants me to put He wanted me to wait till Monday to do it, but he wants Washington straight up. Okay. Uh, which I, I don't hate. But, again, it's tough for me to root for that one, uh, one way or the other. Do you like the line better or do you like the point total? Which one do you – if you were to be recreationally involved in this game, which side would you go to? I think Michigan's going to win by more than four. Ah, that's, right. the one I, that's the one I like. Yeah. Right, there you go. That's what Corey says. So, Corey knows a lot. Well, that's not true. It's the Coracle. No, but that's not true, but I, that's just what I think on this one. I think Michigan's okay. going to win it uh, by – Probably two scores is the way I predict. Ooh. I just don't think Penix can play like that again. See, that I was incredible. I don't think they can slow him down. I don't think All they right. faced anybody they like got him. That D line, um, man, that's a tough D line. I think got, it's even better than Texas's. Got, they got the Joe Moore Award winning offensive line. So you're it's, right. Hey, it, you're right, buddy. It's gonna be a great one, everybody. So tune in. <laughs> I don't know if we'll talk about it on tomorrow's show because we probably won't have a tomorrow show. Correct. We might be that three day a week thing, but. Head to mybookie.ag. Again, use that promo code WARCHANT for your instant cash deposit bonus. MyBookie promo requires $50 minimum deposit and rollover requirement of 10 times your deposit total, including bonus for your withdrawal. For full terms and conditions, visit mybookie.ag slash about dash us. Michael Langston, talk recruiting, coming up right after this. A huge week, Michael, obviously, for Florida State when it comes to recruiting folks. Maybe not so patiently waiting for things to happen, but it started on Saturday with a nice strong trickle and it. Carried on here into Sunday. Let's start, I guess, with uh, Grady Kelly, rather, uh, committing. Obviously, a position of need for Florida State. Uh, just how vital was it to get Grady Kelly? What do you think some of the determining factors were for him making his decision and picking Florida State? Yeah, I think it was a big deal. It's a, a, a solid pickup. Um, you know, certainly after losing Malcolm Ray to, uh, you know, leaving to go to Rutgers, uh, you certainly want to, you know, add to that depth. And I think, I think when you watch his game and he's very twitchy, a six foot three, two ninety three. you know, a guy can do a lot of different things inside and out. Uh, you can even put him on the edge if you need to. He's so quick off the, off the ball that his film just really jumps out to you. And ironically he said he talked to, uh, 
a, a fisk about you know the process and and that helped him solidify it like hey you know this transformation is going to be easy uh you know going over to fsu and they had kind of similar backgrounds and 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 to be honest a lot of stuff he does is is kind of similar to to Braden. so uh i think the fit was there and i think fsu loved them they offered them really early and and then they got it done uh this weekend i think the relationships and just seeing what the culture is around there and and seeing how he fit in there, I think uh, I think he felt that. I think the football stuff was already there. I think it was just the other things, and and once they checked off that, I think uh, that's why it led to uh, him committing today. Like, uh, this is not a depth piece, Michael, is it? This is a guy that I would assume they expect to compete for starting time. Right. Yeah, he's gonna he's probably gonna play a, a good amount of time. Uh, um, certainly a guy that they feel can can impact their their defensive line uh, on a lot of ways, uh, whether it's run or or his pass rush. Uh, certainly a guy that's they've targeted a while uh, since he hit the portal, and uh, one that they feel like can help them pretty pretty frequently and uh, obviously uh, early on. All right. He started all twelve games this past year for Colorado State, grading out at seventy four. Point six, according to our friends at PFF Pro Football Focus. Michael, another guy that, you know, I think there was a lot of good vibes around uh, going even back to last week, and that's uh, Jalen Lucas. What were some of the things that the staff, you think, really zeroed in with uh, Lucas, and what do you think he zeroed in on when it came to this program? Yeah, I think this is probably, for me, uh, you know, one of the most important um, additions, uh, you know, so far. There's a lot of them that were really vital, but uh, this one is just a special teams demon. Um, you can use them a lot on at running back. You can wildcat them. You can you can use him in the slot. You know, receiver and, and there's there's the ways you can use him or just uh, nonstop. But I think the biggest thing for me is is they needed somebody that's a game changer at special teams and punt return and kick return, and that was certainly going to be something that that was an opening. Uh, they didn't know who who would be the guy, and I think. That ends all that when you when you add a guy like this that's that's very elite. Um, I think Big Ten Returner of the Year in 2022, just a guy that really uh, you know changes your team uh, because of what he does at special teams. I think the writing was kind of for me it was on the wall where you know this one just made too much sense. It's from Edna Carr, same school as Destin Hill and Greedy Vance, if I'm not mistaken. Um, he he's had a great relationship with David Johnson, nearly committed. Uh, to FSU, but they were a little late, uh, and he signed with Indiana. But you know they were they were highly interested in the first time, and then the second time they were able to you know pull it out and 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 get it done. But I think it's just a a major pickup for for what can change uh, this Florida State team uh, and how he can flip the field, how he can do certain things that from a speed speed department that's going to add a lot to this offense. It's a very electric playmaker. Um, and, uh, isn't he related to our guy, Ja'Kai Douglas? He is. That's his, uh, younger brother. Um, mm. and, uh, he actually camped at FSU, I would say right like, two or three times. We interviewed him several times uh, when he, when he's camped and, and, uh, like I said, he's, he's a little more wiggly and twitchy than, than Ja'Kai is like Ja'Kai is good, but uh, obviously, and he adds a little, he has a little more speed than the Ja'Kai does. I mean, he is very electric, uh, when the ball's in his hand and not that Ja'Kai isn't. I think everyone loves Ja'Kai, but um, this might be even to another level uh, with Jalen. He's a little smaller, shorter probably, but uh, I think overall is as electric as you can get. Uh, just how important is it, Michael, you know, for him to be so multidimensional, for him to have that special teams kind of element to his game? And was that – is the – versatility really what sold the staff on needing to add him to the class yeah i think they wanted somebody that was an all-purpose guy whether it's a receiver or a running back or whatever uh i think uh, obviously with Jalen, he's a he's an all-purpose running back and i think it was very important to them to add we know how big special teams is to mike norvell and i think that was certainly a driving force that once he entered the portal was kind of like okay we need to get it done you know penn state was certainly after him mississippi state was after him uh, he visited uh, both of those places. Uh, you know, he was coveted, you know, because of what he does. And and FSU was able to have the connections and then get it done and just nail it down. Uh, I've heard he's actually already enrolled, uh, Aslan. He's actually in the team meetings. That's what Matt Masir was telling me earlier today. So, uh, you know, this was kind of like almost like a, a foregone conclusion, I think, that FSU was going to get him, but it's kind of moving fast with a lot of these, uh, you know, pieces with FSU, whether it's 
Earl Little Jr., Jalen Brown, and, and now Jalen Lucas and Grady Kelly today. Um, side note on Grady Kelly, he's like he's rushing back to Denver to get all his stuff, and he's coming right back. So he will be back here uh, probably early next week. So these guys, uh, certainly a, a strong day already for FSU. <laughs> you know, Lucas listed at a uh, corner of our friends. Keep saying friends. Not everybody's our friend. We're very picky about who we associate with, but ESPN's got him listed at 5'9, 170. Uh, and again, 275 yards on the ground, 247 receiving, 572 yards on the kickoff game. And Grady Kelly, by the way, he's from Navarre. So he's a little yeah. bit of a homecoming for that young man. That's cool always to see here. All right, Michael, as, as we talk about things right now on, on Sunday evening here, there's potential. For more down the road, but maybe in the immediate future, do you think? Who are some of the other names that you're keeping an eye on and fans should keep an eye on as we push here into the next week of this month? Well, I would say uh, defensive back Devontae Brown out of Miami. Um, that's a guy that – another kid that's American Heritage. Seems like an American Heritage party. There you got Earl Little and, and then Marvin Jones Jr. Devontae's a part of that. He played there. Um, very good, very good uh, seasons, I think, with Central Florida. But then wasn't so good at Miami – but um, that's a name I've heard quite frequently in the last 48 hours that that I feel like it, it's trending towards FSU, that, you know, something could be intimate as far as um, him joining the fold. He can play safety or corner, so I could see them probably working him at both and then uh, seeing what place is the best for them. Uh, certainly uh, being American Harris, um, Patrick Stratain probably knows him very well uh, as far as what the skill is. He's very tight with – uh, I know the the Brown family is very tight with uh, Randy Shannon. They go way back. I think Randy coached his brother. Um, so I think there's a lot of ties there that are good. Uh, like I said, UCF seemed to be a very attractive prospect. And then Miami wasn't so – it didn't go so well uh, at Miami. But uh, overall, a, a guy that you know, brings size, uh, certainly uh, has the playmaking ability, as we saw when he was at UCF. And kind of see uh where you go there if 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 it is fsu like like we think it is um but that's one that's probably coming up um <laughs> obviously we're think, waiting do you, go ahead. sorry do you, is brown does he project more as a cornerback do you think he would be uh, a safety for them right now i or think he's more of a safety but that's really going to be up to fsu i don't know what their plans are but i i can sense him more as a safety when i watch him um but um, we'll see. Uh, we kind of just have to wait and see. What if if he does pick FSU and he goes there, kind of see where they start him out at. But I, I I see more of a safety when I watch him. All right. Any other names, uh, perhaps in the hopper here? Or is that the is that the front of the line right? Now, I think is going to be Devonte. Uh, no, I I think um, the other ones we're waiting on is Stephon Thompson, a linebacker from Syracuse that visited FSU this week. Uh, visited also Nebraska. I talked to a few Nebraska contacts and they were like, they feel like FSU is in a good spot uh, in, in, and go, even going into that, you know, Nebraska visit. So that's kind of their feelings of if FSU wants them, it feels like there's a good chance they would get them. That's kind they of, want the, him, right. I would think, I, I would think so. You know, I would think so. I mean, he has everything. He lo- I mean, loved what I saw as far as his framework is his, his production is certainly right there. You would think so. I have not heard anything to lead me to believe they don't they won't don't want him or they didn't covet him. So I would I would feel they do. Um so that's kind of what we have on the Thompson uh kind of situation right now. And and like I said, he could decide uh you know today or soon. Um so that's one we're waiting on. Then a uh, few other guys, uh West Virginia defensive end. I'm not even going to try to pronounce that. Mm. <laughs> it's mm. called, uh, I want to say, to- Tamama, Tamwa. Yeah, something like that. Uh, yeah, I'll let Aslan take it over from there. But defensive end from West Virginia, he visited over the weekend. Um, that's a guy that visited Auburn as well, had several visits lined up. He might have had one more after the FSU one. That's one that I think is one of their highest targets on, on deep, at the defensive end edge position. Very important guy that I feel like if they get that guy, it, it really solidifies their room. You already have Marvin, and then they could potentially get one more um, Oregon State's defensive end. DJ, uh, DJ U's uh, teammate uh, visited uh, on, I want to say, Saturday. And uh, everything I've heard is that visit went really well. There's, there's cautious confidence. Uh, I've heard that he might take another visit, but I, I wasn't told exactly where, but – 
I would I guess on the West Coast if he was heading back home. So um, that's kind of something we'll watch. But he's a guy that also is in the picture that FSU likes. So I think they're really addressing this edge position. We're also waiting on Zion Young, who visited Friday out of Michigan State. <laughs> that's another one that they're they're very involved with. So and I've I've been told that FSU feels like they're very much in it for all three of them. So. If you can get two out of those guys, add in what you have with, with Marvin, I think that's a home run as far as what you're looking for, or at least you're addressing it fully at that position. That's probably the number one need for FSU You know, coming into this portal season. So those things are coming up. Um, wide receiver Malik B- uh, Benson is actually on campus right now, or Matt Lassier is out there still waiting to get up with him. He should get up with him soon. Uh, he visited Florida before FSU. We'll see how that visit went. Um, probably concludes around, you know, later tonight. But um, like I said, a lot of stuff going on. They're probably waiting for, uh, you know, probably like three or four of these decisions um, that could come down the pike. So they could get even better news, uh, you know, coming up. So as you can tell, a lot of guys, a lot of situations, a lot of recruitment still going on. They're they're expected to host um, – Alabama running back Roy Dale Williams over there. Mm. He's supposed to come in um, next weekend. Um, so that's another one that I've heard FSU is mainly locked in on him. So uh, that's a guy that I think they've kind of put the target lock on. And uh, I know Alabama's trying to keep him like they did or a little, but um, you, he's, he's expected to be in there next weekend. So I think overall, Aslan, they're, they're, they're hitting on the needs. If you look at every position, they're getting one of each one. You know, Grady Kelly, defensive tackle, you know, defensive end. They already got Marvin Jones. You picked up a wide receiver and Jalen Brown might have more coming. And then you, you obviously have the special teams thing. You hit on that. So there, there's a lot of positions I think they're hitting on. There's still some left, I think, for what they can do either with the decisions that are coming up the next few days or next week with the January, uh, you know, finishing off on that weekend. And then there's some stuff they can do in May. But I think overall, FSU fans should be pleased of of how they're addressing the needs and, and the holes that they have in this roster. Tomiwa Durojaye is you what go. we're going to go with. I like um, it. 64.7 grade out here at PFF this past year, but I got plenty of burn, 270 snaps with West Virginia. He's listed on the Mountaineers' website at 6'4", 278 pounds. Uh, Zion Young, 6'6", 265 out of Atlanta's. Westlake, dude, and I want to say, Michael, I know we get a lot of questions whenever we do those live recruiting <laughs> chats. Yeah. Man, one of our guys out there in Atlanta mentioned this kid because the, the name Zion is not obviously that common. So I, no. I could have sworn someone asked about him. So that's kind of cool to see that maybe become a full circle thing. Um, and then also, obviously, you mentioned uh, Sion Lolohe from Oregon State. Who are the teams that are in the mix? Do we know the other teams? I think, did they say that Zion Young was at Georgia visiting as well? Do you know some of the Yeah, he visited Georgia, and then he went to uh, FSU, and then he went to Missouri. So I think those are the main teams. I've heard more about Missouri and FSU. Um, so I, I've, I've kind of felt like Missouri was like their main competition. And then um, with the Oregon State defensive end, West Coast, I'm going to – I, I, I've heard a little bit. I haven't confirmed it, but, you know, uh, Southern Cal was a team that was mentioned a few times to me with him, uh, that uh, a potential visiting place. But I don't know for sure where he's visiting for sure. But I, I do know they FSU felt good about how the visit went. So uh, certainly having DJ there helps. Uh, by the way, DJ is already on campus. If those are wondering, he arrived on Sunday. So um, he's certainly there. And, and all the guys that they've got commitments from have, have are on campus. So that you, you got to believe that does help some uh, with FSU's chances with him. But a uh, lot of activity, and and you can you can really see that FSU is hoping to lock down this edge position, you know, before they hit that May period. I mean, it, that's the sense I get, Aslan. That they really want to knock this down because that's the number one need. They really just want to nail it. Yeah. Do these guys seem more of the mold of like edge setters to you, Michael, or are these guys more twitchy pass rushers coming off the edge? I think Zion's more of a pass rusher. Um, and then um, I th- I think Zion could do that. Uh, he's certainly effective doing that. His size kind of leads me to believe he sets it more, sets edges more than he does the pass rushing stuff. But, um, and then um, I think with uh, 
Tom, he kind of does a little bit of both. I mean, he he is, like I said, the for me, the highest guy, you know, that I like. You know, I just love, okay. you know, what Tom does. And he's very coveted. That's a guy that they've they've been pretty high on. Uh, FSU's talked to him immediately since he hit the portal. And there's been a strong activity with him. But I think all three are guys that they certainly like. Now, will they take all three? Probably not that many. But uh, will they take two of them? Yeah, I could see that happening. Get two out of the three. I think that locks down your position. All right, then ultimately, Michael, again, there's there's more work to be done here. Hit the thumbs up. Everybody would appreciate yeah. that. Um, you know, but all in all, a, a kind of a good response. You know, th- this coaching yep. staff talks about responding when things maybe don't go yes. their way. Yes. Uh, you know, the running back from uh, Toledo. Yes. Uh, later, ends up going to, to Louisville. They missed right. on the defensive end. They ends up going to Texas A&M. So they were going after the, the top dogs in this cycle, and they weren't able to make it happen. But these other guys that they're – uh, kind of exploring right now. These also seem to be players that are high enough caliber to, to be able to plug and play and, and keep this thing rolling, they hope. Yeah, I think solid response. You look at it, a lot of these guys, you know, Earl Little's from Alabama, you know, Marvin Jones is from Georgia. You know, um, you're still recruiting offensive lineman Terrence Ferguson, who visited FSU. He also visited Oklahoma. That's another one I'm waiting on. So you, you've got a lot of these guys that pair at premier programs, and they're top guys. So, yes, there's been some misses. Penny Boone, they missed on that. Nick Scorrington, they missed on that. Um, but you're going to miss some because of the way college football is where other teams are, are actually going to get you. And sometimes things don't work in your advantages where it's location or situation. So, I mean, the main thing is just having a plan for whatever you do. And I, I think FSU's done a really good job of dissecting what they want, but taking their time to make sure this guy fits everything we want. You know, so I think it's a great response so far. I think it could be a really good response if you can get the linebacker from Syracuse and then maybe add one more edge guy or two. Two would be like home run. Uh, but if you get the linebacker and you get the edge guys done, I think that's a great situation. I do think <laughs> they still want an experienced receiver. Jalen Brown, we talked about, very talented, but uh, still very young. Still, still basically you're getting another high school kid, in my opinion, because he's got four years but I think you would like an experienced receiver and probably a big body receiver. Yeah. You'd like more big bodies in there to work with. So I think that's kind of the next thing in May, in my opinion, of what FSU does is go out there and look at and see if a guy emerges in May when all these guys finish spring practice and then bam, somebody pops in there between that May 1st, May 15th window. I could see that one of the positions that they go after. Offensive tackle is another thing. So uh, I think they're closer, and, and a majority of this, I think, is going to likely get done, but there's still going to be work to do. And uh, uh, But I think it was a great response, uh, right to your uh, what you alluded to. I think it was a great response by FSU. Try to tell people, relax, let the coaches do their job. They're going to get the guys. So certainly the good news is, is certainly starting to roll in the last few days uh, with FSU picking up four commits. And we're probably going to hang out again on Monday, I bet, doing one of these videos, probably. Sounds like. <laughs> I don't want to put words in your mouth, Michael, but okay. sounds like, right? We'll see. Uh, we'll, we will see how it goes. Stay connected, everybody, to the premium recruiting board over on warchant.com. Uh, and check out shop.cummins.com. Use that promo code TAILGATE, T-A-I-L-G, numeral 8, and save 10% off their great items like their portable power stations, their RV generators, their portable generators get all the information you need to get your house backed up as well so check them on out on behalf of michael langston and Corey clark i'm as on of andy I want to thank you guys for tuning on in hit the thumbs up on the way out stay connected to warchant.com matt lasser michael langston got you covered with all things recruiting and hopefully maybe some other guys uh, go ahead and commit today and if they do we'll have all that over at warchant.com we'll be back probably not until thursday Probably not until Thursday because we're going to watch the national title game tonight. Tuesday's a travel day for your guys. So we'll probably be back for a, a, a show together Wednesday for your Thursday, and then we'll do a mailbag on Thursday for Friday, tentatively, tentatively, unless they end up getting loads and loads of like super duper stars, as Corey likes to say, through the transfer portal. But until then, the Jeff Cameron Show has got you covered 1 to 3 o'clock, and then everything else over at warchant.com, the ultimate symbol sports source. Thanks again for Michael for hopping on, and for Corey, I'm Aslan. Thank you for listening to Wake Up Warchant, presented by Corner Pocket Bar and Grill.